do such things. But why don't you guys uh, join us as we start worshiping this morning with standing, and we will start with some singing.
please join me as we uh, read some scripture together. O oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have known and heard. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. But in spite of this, the people kept sinning. Despite his wonders, they refused to trust him. So he ended their lives in failure, their years in terror. When God began killing them, they finally sought them. They repented and took God seriously. Then they remembered that God was their rock, that God most high was their redeemer. Please continue us as we sing another song.
Thank you, worship team. Uh, as we continue our service, I just want to share with you a few quick announcements. Some of these will be for those of you watching online, and some of these, those are for you here in the service this morning. But the first is we are starting our live stream starting today, so we would love to hear feedback from those of you watching online. Let us know what worked, what didn't, so that we can continue to improve. And if you're watching this at a later time, we would love to see you join us in person, whether that's here in the service or online live so that we can continue to connect with you. Uh, next Sunday, we have Lisa Onrat from Haiti Arise coming to share, and we are so excited to hear from her, to hear what is happening with Haiti Arise on the ground, um, and just get better connected with their ministry and what's happening. The reason Mark isn't coming is he is in Haiti right now, so we're excited to hear that update. And normally when they come around Christmas time, they're able to have a Christmas um, marketplace that they set up in the lobby, but due to COVID, that isn't a possibility this year. So if you are interested in getting some of the handmade Haitian items that they normally bring with them, they have set up an online website where you can sign up to buy things and she will bring them on the 22nd if you say that you want pickup for the 22nd. There isn't a way to say she, you want it here at, in Saskatoon. It says Airdrie, but if you pick, say you want pickup on the 22nd, she'll know to bring it to our church that day so you can get it. The website is madeinhaitiforhaiti.com. If you have any in want any information on what, how to do that, how to buy things, you can come talk to me. We will have a link posted on our Facebook page right away with more information as well. And then on November 29th, it is the beginning of Advent. And that means that we will be having communion to launch off the Advent season. So if you are online and you want to join us in communion, make sure to be prepared for that on November 29th. And with it be, being the beginning of Advent, we will be launching our Advent project that day as well. We're going to be raising $10,000 for MCC's New Roots campaign. This is their centennial campaign. They've been running things for 100 years. And this money is going to be going to COVID relief. So food, sanitation, hygiene, a bunch of different projects that they're running to help with relief efforts. So if you are interested in um, supporting that, please prayerfully consider how you might do so. And then on the 29th, Randy Clausen from MCC will be coming to share a bit more about that. And lastly, during the Advent season, we try and find ways to um, help you as our fa Cornerstone family connect with Jesus during the season and to get prepared for Christmas. And so starting next week, we will have digital Advent material available for all ages. But on top of that, our family ministry team is running an event called Christmas in a Box. And this is going to be a box full of surprises and crafts and interactive activities for the whole family. For the parents, it's pre-made, and for the kids, it's just a ton of fun. So if you are interested in signing up to get one of those boxes, you can head to our website. All of the information is there. And pick up. you can pick them up from the church, or we can deliver them the week of November 22nd to 29th. If you have any questions about how that all works, please contact Pastor Dawn, and she can give you more information. And now as we head into our sermon, uh, I want to read to you from Matthew 25, 14 through 29, which says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on a trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of sil silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called to give them, account for them to give an account of how they had used his money. 
The servant to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned you five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I earned you two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid to lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who had ten bags of silver. To those who use it well, they are given much, and even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. This time, I'd like to uh, invite Pastor Rick up to share with us this morning, and as he comes, I'll pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to hear from you this morning. I pray that the words Pastor Rick shares would not be his own, but they would be yours. Allow us to have ears to hear and hearts to listen what you have for us this morning. Be speaking through Pastor Rick, and allow us to each encounter you in a new and real way this morning. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Michael. It's fascinating how uh, what we believe about God impacts the way we, pre <laughs> yeah, what we think about God really impacts the way we think about God. That was profound. Uh, by the way, good morning and welcome. It is good to have you here, those of you who uh, are here physically and those of you who are not. Let me start by saying that I'm actually being very legal and uh, I'm not masked this morning thanks to a provision that was made in the public health order on masking that they released on Friday. And there was an exemption made for, uh, among others, individuals under the age of two. No. Uh, those participating in aquatic activities. No. And 2M clergy members who are leading a service. So thank you, Dr. Shahab. Uh, last week was fascinating. I don't know, you know, I smiled and I frowned and I cried and nobody knew that I'd done any of those things. But, uh, so, uh, having cleared that up, let me say welcome uh, to all of you and to those of you who are viewing from home, we think. Uh, we'll see how this all works out, but uh, it's good to be able to do this with uh, a live studio audience. I rejoice in that. This morning we are live streaming the service and my hope is that in doing this while seeing a bit of a drop in quality, perhaps for those of you at home, uh, we at least are all more or less hearing the same things, having the same opportunity to worship our God. A great God, a loving God, which takes us sort of back to the, 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 the scripture reading where if you think God is miserly, if you think God is mean, if you think God is not interested uh, or is just out for his own benefit, you become miserly yourself. And we don't share, we don't do those things, and we find ourselves in an awkward position of, of misreading who God truly is. So, uh, a God, a God who reveals himself and a God who loves us. This is uh, Lake Louise on July 22nd of this year. I took that from far too close to the edge. Uh, Sylvia and I have climbed up a big beehive trail and we're now about 500 meters above Lake Louise. Sylvia is on her way further up the trail to the real lookout and I have started to feel the mountain tremble a little bit and I am lingering to rest. I'm, I'm, I'm taking an unusual interest in very small things that are close to the ground, like lichen and moss. And uh, I've just sort of gotten close to the ground. I've moved far away from the edge, and I'm actually sitting very snugly against this huge rock that's rooted into the mountain 
uh, and I'm observing the ground. But as I'm pretending to take pictures and examine minuscule phenomena, a couple of young women come up the mountain to this point, and they go over to the edge with their phones and take the requisite selfies. And then one of them moves closer to the edge so that the other can take pictures of her. Now, by this point, I am looking at a fascinating specimen of a gray-rimmed fire dot lichen, which I never knew anything about until that very moment. Uh, so I only hear the conversation, but what I hear is um, from the picture taker, you're way too close to the edge, come back. And I look up, and yes, she's far too close to the edge, unless she has a hang glider. But she laughs, and she steps even further out. Now, a brave man would have let go of the rock and run out and grabbed her and brought her back to safety. But instead, I got a little bit dizzy, and I found myself clinging even closer to this big rock, going, oh, because I wanted a good grip when the screaming started. When we're scared, when we are uncertain, when we feel like we're, we're clinging to the, the scree on a mountainside when it's trembling, on a mountain that's precariously perched on the surface of a tiny planet that's spinning rapidly around a sun that's hurtling through the galaxy as that galaxy wends its way through the universe, well, let's just say life is precarious. And when stuff feels uncertain, we want certainty. And when we realize that certainty isn't available, we're happy for confidence. Christian confidence is found in our assurance that God is. He exists. We believe that there is something out there, but last week we said that unless that something reveals itself, we're just fumbling in the dark making stuff up about it. Educated guesses, perhaps, but in essence, they all come back to our limited comprehension and our predictable responses. But the good news, the good news is that this something has revealed himself. We find confidence in the fact that God's not out there hiding. Instead, he has chosen to show himself to us in his creation and in the story of his chosen people, Israel. But even that wasn't as clear as it needed to be, and people got confused. So as the writer of Hebrews said in the first chapter, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Last week we said, if we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. He's not just a reflection of God's goodness. We believe that God himself in the flesh is Jesus, living and speaking and walking with us. As Christians, we have this confidence that God exists and that God reveals himself. But Christian confidence is, is grounded in this wonderful fact. God redeems. God's not just a silent observer. He hasn't created the world and then stood back. God acts, God intervenes, and when we couldn't bail ourselves out, when we found ourselves torn away from the shore by the current, when we discovered that we were sick without a cure, when we were trapped and had no way out, at that moment we discover that God saves us, that he redeems us, that he ransoms us. He calls us back to himself and restores us. Our God redeems. Christmas is coming. Does that scare anybody else? <laughs> we had the snow for it, but Christmas is coming. Advent begins in just two weeks, and, and we often think of the words of Galatians chapter 4, New American Standard in my mind, in that context. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. NLT says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, 
God sent him to buy freedom for us, we who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. God acting on our behalf, redeeming us, entering time and space, adopting us. Born of a woman, one of us, like us, come to redeem us, to buy freedom. We who were slaves. In days of Black Lives Matters, we are all aware of the crushing oppression of slavery. And if we're not, we aren't listening. But hopefully we've never experienced it. Still, whether it's the story of a slave ship bound for the Americas or women and children trapped aboard a container ship as part of the sex trade, it ought to make us weep. Caught, ripped from home and family, kept from their birthright, trapped, unable to escape, forced to do unimaginable things, far from home, fearing death and worse, without any hope. Now, we, we don't often think of ourselves in that light, but admit it. There are things that you do that you wish you didn't. Habits, patterns, behaviors, Oh, let's call them sin. Those Pauline, that which I would not, that do I do moments. Trapped in our sin and our shame. Even the best of us struggle with the power of sin. And that sin separates us from our God. We find ourselves far from home and without hope. And in that very moment, God comes and redeems us. He buys our freedom. He comes as a redeemer. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 to 18, tells us this. This is what redemption looks like. God's revelation of himself, his plan, his love, and his redemption. Hear the word of God. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he's able to help us when we are being tested. God redeems God reveals himself in his son, Jesus. Jesus comes as one of us, made in every respect like us. Come to help us, to redeem us. God redeems. His plan was for that son to come as a willing sacrifice for our sin, offering up his life as a ransom for ours. Come to purchase us, to redeem us. God redeems. God's love is seen in his son come so that we might have eternal life through him. He's come to take our fears to redeem us. This is our Christian confidence. Not only does, does God exist, not only does God reveal himself, but God redeems his people. He changes our lives from the inside out. He sets us free from sin and slavery to sin. He sets us free from the fear of death. God redeems his people. And so the Easter verses of 1 Corinthians 15 are actually our banner of victory. It's a flag we march under if you want. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? 
For the st- sin is the sting that results in death. And law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if Pastor Len were here, he would yell amen. Because he's just that kind of guy. But it's an amen moment. He has given us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a confidence that we share. It's a confidence that changes the way we live. Are you scared of dying? You you don't need to be. We know the end of the story. Are you burdened by your sin and shame? We don't need to be. We can be redeemed and forgiven. And our God sets us free from those so that we can share that in this world. He gives us a a place to stand that's stirred and firm and a rock. Centuries before the coming of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah 44. He said, this is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. There is no other God. Who's like me? Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock. Not one. There is no other rock. There is no other place that we can go for shelter, for confidence, for the knowledge that we stand firm in him. Mm, the, the girl on Beehive, Big Beehive Trail, you might want to know that she didn't plummet to her death. Just as her friend was obviously getting very scared, I heard a yell, more like a scream, but not a scream of, ah, I'm going over the edge. Whatever it was, I don't know what was said, but it was in Mandarin, And it was exceedingly clear that mother had arrived and was having nothing to do with her daughter standing on uncertain ground. And the daughter quickly scrambled back onto the solid rock. Shortly afterwards, Sylvia came back and laughed at me, curled around my rock. She was doing it in a very loving way, of course. But she laughed and she reminded me that I was actually standing on a really big rock. That it was solid. That over by the edges it might be a little bit scary, but that I could be confident that it wasn't apt to shift and slide under me. And then she took my hand. And she walked me back down the mountain. Sometimes we just need someone to remind us that we're standing on the rock. And that rock is Jesus. Despite the uncertainties and turmoil around us, we can have confidence in these things. God is. He exists. God reveals himself to his people. And God redeems. And if you feel like you're on shaky ground, look beside you and see God with us. Jesus standing there, waiting to take our hand and walk with us. You think about that. Amen. Would you pray with me? Let's bow. Lord, we talk about uncertain ground and in the midst of COVID, a lot of us feel that. There are stresses and strains and we're adapting and we're we're, we're always shifting things it feels like and it's uncertain. And so we come to you and we pray that you would give us this certainty in who you are 
and what you're like. We acknowledge as well, Lord, that there are many in our congregation who in the last few weeks have gone through just a whole lot of other stuff as well. And so we pray for those stresses, but we pray for the medical procedures and the medical needs that have been uh, weighing on people's hearts. Lord, we know that there are those who are suffering from Crohn's. We know those who've had uh, quadruple bypass. We know of uh, retinal detachment and surgeries, and we know of all sorts of orthopedics that have been done. And we know that there are recovery times, and we know, Lord, that in all of it, we can hold these loved ones to you and ask, Lord, for your presence, that you would take their hand and walk with them. I think of those, Lord, who are bereaved in the midst of COVID. We pray that you would do more than just hold their hand. We pray, Jesus, that you would wrap them in your arms and hold them dear. We pray, Father, in all these things, that you would give us a confidence rooted not in medical science, not in people, not in blind faith. But Lord Jesus, you would give us a confidence in who you are and your character as has been revealed in nature and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for your love and your presence in our lives. We pray that you would allow that we would keep our eyes fixed upon you, the author and finisher of our faith. Be our vision, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team, if you would come. Whether you're joining us online or in person, I welcome you to come and worship with us, whether that be to stand, whether sitting or kneeling, or however you feel best, uh, we can come together and worship our Lord and Savior. So please join us.
You can be seated. In a moment, the ushers are going to come and dismiss you wedding style. And as you leave, we're encouraging you, as always, to maintain that six-foot bubble between you and people not in your bubble. Keep that mask on as well. If you're looking for a way to connect, please contact us here at the church. Phone actually works. Uh, Facebook, email. We're here and we're offering a whole bunch of small and pod groups as opportunities to connect. Take advantage of those. And if you'd like prayer, prayer's a, a fascinating thing, isn't it? Uh, we pray in generalities in service because giving names, you always forget somebody, it seems. And there are needs, and you have needs, and we want to pray for them. Contact us that way. Use our prayer chain online. Uh, or just give us a call. If you know others that need prayer, let us know that as well. We want to uh, be together in this, as separated as we are with six-foot spacing. So I'd love you to leave this morning changed, charged, ready to face this week, confident and ready uh, because you know that God's with us. And 
that despite the shaky feeling that many of us get, he walks with us and roots us to and on the rock. That's important because I don't want you to miss this. The, the reason God gives us hope and confidence and faith isn't so you feel good. That's a byproduct. There's still a lot of people right now in your school, in your neighborhood, and all around you who are feeling shaky. I want us to leave this morning knowing that they may not be ready to take the hand of Jesus and walk with him. But they certainly may be ready to take your hand and have you walk beside them. And then you get a chance to let them know why you are confident. Confident in the rock, Christ Jesus. Final word comes from Psalm 61, verse 2. It's a reminder and it is a blessing. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me, O Lord, to the rock that's higher than I. He's your redeemer. He's your creator and friend. Seek him, obey him, and reflect him. You are his people, and you are blessed. Go in that. Amen. Thank you.